good afternoon uh, to this today's hashtag Wednesday's weekly uh, training session. It's called Data Protection in, in Practice, and we have Peter Denton from our Health Watch team, who is also our Data Protection Officer here at Action Together. Hand over to you, Peter. Okay, thank you. I hope everybody can see me and hear me okay and see the slides. Um, one thing I will say is, or two things to start off with. Um, sometimes when we're doing data protection training, people might want to talk about stuff that is a little bit sensitive or confidential because we're being filmed. Just be careful about what you say before you say it. Um, and if you want to send me an email afterwards or something, if you've got a more sensitive question, I'm happy to cover that. And the other is I'll make sure Roma's got a set of the slides afterwards so she can email them out to people whose contact details she's got. So have I gone two slides? So the aims of today are to think about how do I spot personal data? How do I know how to process it appropriately? Actually, what processing do I do? Who's accountable? How do I check that I'm in doing it legally? Um, and then built into data protection legislation is some principles and some rights. Uh, and then the bit that is usually the most exciting bit is what do I do if something goes wrong? Um, so hopefully you'll find those useful. Um, if anybody wants to talk about anything else, um, just put a comment in the chat and I will do my best to cover it on the way past. Um, we've talked about housekeeping already. I think Rome has covered all of these. Uh, I don't want to talk at you for two hours, which is the time we've got down for the session. Um, if there aren't many questions, we might be done in an hour. If there's lots of questions, it will take longer. Um, and if you need to step away at any point, just do. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. I've got the chat window open. Um, so if you type anything in there and I spot it, I will pick it up. Uh, and do feel free to type questions as we go rather than wait to the end because it may well be it's relevant before we move on. Um, first thing I want to do is to talk about some of the legal basics. I think it's really important because data protection is a really important topic for everybody. Um, so just giving you a little bit of context about the law I think is useful. But I am assuming that actually it's your organization's board, your trustees, your committee or senior paid staff who are actually accountable for the decisions about how data is processed when it's processed and why you process it. So this isn't about how you're accountable as an organization. It's aimed at helping you as an individual to make good decisions, good choices about your data handling. Uh, and actually it seems, may seem a bit strange. We're talking about GDPR and the Data Protection Act. So why am I talking about human rights? But that's actually because they are fundamentally underpinning the data protection legislation. And actually one of the reasons GDPR is a set of regulations rather than a directive from Europe, which is what previous data protection legislation came under. Um, and that's because not every, na every nation based its data protection legislation around human rights. And the EU said, we're gonna force you to do this by making it a regulation. Um, and the four fundamental principles in there, something about a right to respect for life and family life, and for uh, home and for correspondence. A human right that interference by public bodies must be within the law and necessary. Uh, and some of the functions that we do as charities put us close to that public body boundary. So we need to make sure that is in our minds. Um, human rights legislation gives everyone a right to protection of personal data concerning them and also says that data must be processed fairly for specified purposes on the basis of consent or other legitimate basis. So I always think it's useful when we're talking about data protection to go back to what are the human rights elements that underpin this, um, because they then help you to understand some of the thinking behind the specifics in the legislation. Uh, and it's not new. Data protection legislation is not new. We've had it since 1961. Um, 
so um, it's been around a while. Interestingly, the first data protection legislation related to computers rather than organisations, because they were so blinking big and there were so few of them, it was easier to legislate for the people who owned computers um, rather than um, the organisations that manage it. Uh, the most relevant ones for us are the bottom four on the list. PECA, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, that is important if you do things like e-bulletins and online stuff. Um, there's some stuff in PECA that covers that. GDPR, we all heard the big fanfare. You're going to say he's got the date wrong. It says 2016. It actually was enacted from May 2018 in the UK, but actually the regulations were written in 2016 and there was a two year leading period. So we all left it to the last minute and panicked in the last two months. Um, Data Protection Act, you may or may not be aware that when GDPR came in, the UK wrote a new Data Protection Act um, to make sure that GDPR would remain in UK legislation post Brexit and a few other things. And there are things called derogations in GDPR, which are decisions that can be made at a nation state level. And it put out the UK approach to those derogations in it as well. Uh, and of course, Brexit's coming along um, and there's a whole load of Brexit law that relates to data protection. Um, because this is being filmed, I'm going to remind people this is November 2020. And if things go to the currently published timetable, we will be leaving the EU in January. Initially, GDPR will continue to have effect in England and well, in Great Britain, but we don't know how long that will last and importantly if you do any work that involves data going out of the UK into the rest of Europe at this point in time we do not know whether we will or not be um, granted adequacy so the European Union could turn around and say actually we don't like what's written into the UK's Data Protection Act and other legislation doesn't give us enough assurance that you're going to continue to be able to process data um, fully in line with GDPR. Therefore, you're not an adequate partner and we will need to then put some different processes in place for that data transfer. Um, so we don't know on that. I will let make sure that information goes out through Action Together if I hear of anything that needs people to change. Um, and what we're not going to talk about today is a great long list because we would still be here next Wednesday if we did. So I'm not going to go into any detail on data transfers, data sharing, paper-based filing, the wonderfully named pseudonymization, postal marketing, electronic and email marketing, telephone marketing that's automated or non-automated, Information Society Services for Children, Freedom of Information Act, Law Enforcement and Fraud, Criminal Offence Data, Intelligence Services and Public Security, the Computer Misuse Act, or the NIST Directive, the Directive on Security of Network and Information Systems. If you need help on any of those as an organisation, if you contact Action Together, I'm sure we can provide some support around it. It's just about, I did six days of data protection training. I'm trying to do two hours and you can't cover everything in two hours. So if you need to know on any of those, please do get in touch and we'll do our best to support you. So that's your legislative framework. Um, and it's then worth thinking about definitions because the most common thing that I see is people thinking the data protection applies when it doesn't, or people not realizing it applies when it does. So getting some definitions clear in our minds, I think is quite useful. Um, so um, we can talk about that. And it's interesting, I just, just spotted in the chat, Lynn from the Badger Protection Group uh, particularly like to know how we can protect both the badges and members of the public who walk past the cameras. Hopefully um, you will have some more thoughts on that at the end by the time we've gone through this. So uh, thank you for that comment, Lynn. Anybody else wants to put anything in the chat, please do. Um, 
first definition that I think it's really worth thinking about is what does necessary mean? Because it comes up an awful lot in particularly in data protection legislation, but generally in legislation. And it's reasonably needed is the easiest way to think about it. It's not strictly needed, it's reasonably needed. And an example I would give about that is Amazon don't need your phone number to deliver a package to an address that you've given them. It is reasonable for them to ask for it. So if their delivery driver can't find the address, they can phone you up. So that's how I, I tend to think of it is, is it reasonable? Well, yes, if you're waiting for a delivery and they can't find your address, it's perfectly reasonable for them to want to give you a call. So if you think about what data you're asking for, you can ask for more than is strictly necessary, providing you can justify why it's reasonable. Um, used to be the old saying that the, the man on the Clapham omnibus, I tend to say if you stopped six random people in the street and asked them if it was reasonable and you thought most of them would say yes, you're probably right to ask for the data. So just think, you know, if I, if I stepped outside my front door now and asked the first six people that passed, what would they say? Um, so this is the first data protection related definition. Um, and this is at the key of everything. Uh, personal data. This is what is covered by GDPR and the Data Protection Act. And it is defined as information relating to an identifiable living individual. And I'll just leave that there for you to think about a second. So relating to an identifiable living individual. So are three tests, if you're thinking about does the Data Protection Act and GDPR apply? Can somebody be identified? Are they alive and does it relate to them? Not is it about them, but does it relate to them? On my next slide, um, we can do in a second because Jane has put a question up that's interrupted my flow of thought, but really useful. Uh, she's asked what happens if funders, I presume, uh, ask to collect data that we ourselves wouldn't need. I think I would go back to the funder and say, how are you going to use that data? Ask them. And if you think that their request is reasonable, it's fine. If you think their request is unreasonable, um, have a conversation with them and say, well, actually, we don't need it. Um, maybe they've got a, a duty to collect it, depending on who the funders are. You know, the, so, for example, some organisations have higher obligations under the Equality Act to do some monitoring. So you might not be monitoring a particular um, protected characteristic group, but they may require data uh, because they've got a legal duty to. So have a conversation. If you think somebody's asking you to collect data that you don't need, try to understand why they need it. Um, so the next one is actually a question for you, and I'm happy for people to put answers in the chat or unmute themselves. Um, I've just given some examples of data and just giving you a chance to think, is this personal data in the context of the Act? So the first one is, do we think that data which relates to any person is per always personal data? I'm seeing some nods and I'm seeing people mouth yes. Um, the answer is not always. Because if you can't identify the person, if the person cannot be identified, it's not personal data. So, for example, if you've got a spreadsheet with a whole load of figures on it, but it's not possible to identify the individuals, even if that data relates to individual people. If you can't identify them, that is not personal data. So a statistical report, it's data that relates to people, but if it's just a statistical report with nothing personally identifiable in it, Data Protection Act does not apply. And also it could relate to people who've died and Data Protection Act does not, does not apply to somebody who is not living. 
However, if you've got medical records, there is different legislation about medical records and people who've died. At the moment, da well, data that relates to a UK citizen, generally, yes, that will be included and covered by data protection legislation. Although you could argue that if it's a UK citizen who lives outside the UK and the European Union and the data processing is going on outside the UK and the European Union. So, for example, somebody lives in America. UK data protection legislation will not apply to their American bank processing their data in America. So it's not necessarily about where the person's born. Similar would apply to an EU citizen at the moment because um, we're still in the EU and if we get adequacy, um, data which relates to a European Union citizen, um, yes, generally speaking, it will apply, particularly if we're processing it in the UK. And actually nationality, somebody's nationality does not affect data protection law. If it is being processed in the UK, UK data protection law applies even if the person doesn't live in the UK and isn't an EU citizen or a UK citizen. So it's about where the data is processed. Um, so yes, Sandra, you just said it's about finding the context of gathering, holding, distributing. Yet your organization should know where your data comes from, how it's used, where it's stored, who it's given to. Um, but that's your senior officers, your trustees, your committee, your board, whatever the accountable group of people in your organization is. That's their responsibility, not yours as a frontline worker necessarily. Um, final one, data that relates to an organization. And I see this used quite a lot as a reason for saying the law does not apply. If the data that relates to an organization also relates to an identifiable living individual. So an, a community group secretary's email address or phone number, that is personal data. So it is not sufficient to say, oh, it's just contact details for this group, because if an individual can be identified, that is personal data. Um, and I've heard an awful lot of people say it's just contact details for this group. Um, and even if you're a small organisation and you're exempt from registering with the Information Commissioner's Office, the principles of GDPR still apply to what you do. Um, a bit more about definitions and personal data. Is it correct to say that it's only personal data if you or your organization can identify the person? No. It's if the person can be identified. And a really good example of this, you may remember about four, three, four years ago, Virgin Media used to post out to the occupier and a household address. They no longer do that. And that's because you can combine an address with the electoral register, which is a public document, and get the name of the occupier, particularly if it's a single occupancy house. So that with GDPR, that became personal data. It didn't used to be. The law used to be if, if you could identify it was personal data, if somebody else couldn't. The law has just changed subtly, so it's now if the person can be identified. But there is a caveat which basically says, but if you need specialist knowledge to identify them, it's not personal data. So if you need a membership, you know, membership records for an organization to identify somebody, those membership records will be private. So it's a little bit of a gray area, but it's, less identifiable. It's still personal data, but it's less identifiable. 
Um, but if you've got a list of you know, unique identifiers and a secure list of who those people translate to in the real world, that data on the list that's got the unique identifiers on it may not be personal data because it requires additional specialist information, specialist knowledge. But if you've got quest situations like that, contact us, ask. It's always best to assume that something is personal data, but there are some situations in which you can treat it that it isn't. Most important one, and one of my pet issues, the fact that something is personal data doesn't mean you can't process it. Data protection should never be used as an excuse for not doing something. You should always have a business, you, business reason for doing something or a business reason for not doing it. Data protection legislation is to make you do it legally and lawfully and fairly. So the fact that something is personal data doesn't mean you can't process it. You just need to make sure that your processing is lawful. Um, and because legislation is open to interpretation, if you do something new with personal data, something you've not done before as an organisation, you need to think about actually what are the checks and balances in this. There is a process called a data protection impact assessment, which your organisation may have to do by law and is quite often a useful thing to do. That should be something that's done at a leadership level with the relevant staff members involved or volunteers. It's not something you should be doing on your own on a particular project. It should be something that involves some senior leaders from the organisation and some operational staff. So you understand what's going to happen, how it's going to work. So that's generally personal data, I, data that relates to an identifiable living individual. And it's really useful to have that phrase somewhere in the back of your mind. Can I identify this person? Does the data relate to them? And are they still living? And actually, are they a person? Data that relates to an organisation, but not to a person is not covered. So next we come on to what used to be called sensitive personal data. GDPR changed that to special category data. And it also split out some stuff into a different category. So if you're processing any of these, they are special category data. Race or ethnic origin, political opinions, religion and philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, and interestingly, having a record that somebody is not a trade union member is deemed to be trade union membership data. If you don't know whether somebody is or not, that's fine. But if you record that somebody isn't, that is still trade union membership data. Physical and mental health, sex life, sexual orientation, genetic personal data based on DNA and RNA, and one that potentially could catch some of us out, um, particularly if you use Facebook, biometric data in the context of identity. The Facebook tag, the tag your friend in this image algorithm is biometric data processing in the context of identity. It is special category data. So if you use any facial recognition software through Facebook or through, you know, my personal photo editing software um, actually has facial recognition built into it so I can build libraries of people up. Uh, so just make sure if it's a public facing thing, it's turned off. If it's a private thing for archive purposes, private as in not disclosed outside your organisation, you just need to make sure you've got the appropriate, you're meeting the appropriate conditions for processing for it. Um, so that's the one that is new and likely to catch people out. Biometric data in the context of identity. Um, and this is where it's different. Personal data is permitted. 
processing per personal data is permitted, providing you've got a lawful basis. Processing special category data is prohibited unless you meet additional conditions. So generally speaking, you can, you can process personal data and not be too worried, providing you follow the principles, you've got a lawful basis. If you're processing special category data, you need to be much more careful about what you do with it. That's why it's called special category. And criminal offence information used to be part of sensitive personal data. It is now a category all of its own. And it's worth being aware that it includes allegations, criminal convictions, uh, criminal proceedings and convictions. So actually, whilst we're all working from home, there's less likely to be gossip around the office. Um, less likely to be uh, sort of gossip around the office. But if there is an allegation of something, you need to be really careful that people don't talk about it because that is an allegation and it's criminal offence information. And also a DBS check is criminal offence information. Just going back to the chat, sorry, I wasn't looking at it. Um, so anonymized case studies we're talking about. The question, just going back to the what is personal data bit, I would say, if possible, always check if you're using a case study, get permission if you can, because in order to get it to the point where somebody cannot be identified, it will quite often lose most of its meaning particularly if it's health and care related, because health data is special category data. Sorry to jump, jump back a touch there, I hadn't spotted the comment. So certainly in Health Watch, what we do is if we're engaging with people and they're telling us something that we think might turn into a case study to go into a report, we'll make sure we've got some contact details and we'll go back to them and say, we'd like to use this in our report. This is the wording we're going to use. Are you okay with us doing that? Then that's fine, you've got consent. There's no questions. In fact, you've got explicit consent if you do it to that degree. Um, so criminal offence data, those of us who have to DBS check volunteers or staff members, we just need to be conscious that it is um, a data category all of its own, and we can't just routinely ask for it. Um, and again, just the general office thing of if somebody's accused of stealing from the petty cash, for example, and people start talking about it between colleagues, that is an allegation. That is criminal offence inf information. So we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be doing it anyway, because it's based on human rights. Um, so again, I'm happy for people to um, type in the chat. My next sort of interactive chunk, although we didn't get much interaction in the last one, is just thinking about um, which of these might include personal data, special category data, or criminal offence data. So contact details for a community group, I think is not likely to include special category or criminal offence data. But it depends on the nature of the group. You know, if it's a group for uh, ex-offenders, there's potentially some criminal offence data there. If it's a support group around a particular medical condition, there's particular, potentially some um, special category health data there. An individual survey response. The chances are it's going to be personal data. You may well, it may well be possible to identify somebody from it. And the person could disclose health status, could disclose criminal record status, even if you've not asked for it. And if somebody reminds me later on, if we don't cover it, I'll talk about what to do if people disclose information you don't want. Because I think that's a useful thing to think about. Notes from a focus group are very much like an individual survey response. 
Um, public social media page, again, could have personal data, could have special category data, could have criminal offence data. There is something we'll come to in a minute about um, the conditions for processing special category data that social media relates to. So it's worth keeping that in mind. Mailing list of support group members very likely to contain special category data if it's a health related support group. If you've got a case file or notes relating to a client could quite easily be, it's going to be personal data could contain the other two. Files about staff or volunteers again and the one that people never think about or rarely think about. Contact details of staff and volunteers that you work with outside your organisation. You know, if you've got the personal email address of somebody in the council, that is personal data, even though it's relating to their role in the organisation. Which is why I always recommend, uh, just a practical thing here, if you're sending a group email, send it to yourself and put all the recipients in the BCC field unless they've given permission to share their email addresses within that group. That way you're not going to disclose stuff that you shouldn't. Um, and we have had a data breach that I've become aware of. I don't think we did it. I think it was one of our external partners that did it, um, who actually disclosed some personal data and it was technically a data breach by not using the BCC function. Excuse me, I just needed a mouthful of coffee there. So we've covered now personal data, special category data, criminal records data. Does anybody want to ask any questions about that before we move on to what data processing is? I have a... I have silence, I have no hands raised, I have no comments. That's great. I'm just conscious that there's an awful lot to take in and if I don't consciously pause every now and then, um, people might disappear, and lose the will to live and various other things that often happen when you're talking about data protection. Um, so, data processing is everything on that list. It's everything you do from the first point that you get information that relates to an identifiable living indi individual until you no longer have that information. It is everything you do with that information. It's collecting it, it's entering it onto a computer system, it's analyzing survey results, focus group notes, anything like that. Sending an email is data processing. Publishing a report is data processing if anybody in the report is identifiable. Making a referral to a service is data processing. Doing a joint piece of work is data processing. Storing paper files is data processing if they are in a structured filing system. So if you've just got random bits of paper with notes on, that isn't personal data, isn't covered by the legislation. But if you have paper files that are organised in a way, and you could even argue making notes on the day, you know, if you've got a page to a day diary, making notes on that page turns it into personal data covered by the legislation because it's an organised system, it's organised by date. So storing paper files can be covered. Archiving and backing up computer data, really important. You know, one of the data breaches that you might be required to report if it happens is loss of data. You know, your computer dies, you lose the data on your hard drive. So archiving, backing things up is really important, but it is data processing activity. So you need to make sure it's done appropriately. Uh, and finally, deleting and disposing of files and records um, is uh, data processing activity. Um, is a notebook data pro processing is a question. If it's 
if it could be argued that it's structured, you know, it's stored in a structured way, you could say, yes, I would be inclined to say it's very borderline. Um, so, yeah, I would say if you've got a notebook, if it's got special category data or criminal uh, criminal offences data in it, treat it really, really carefully. If it's just notes from meetings and there's nothing particularly sensitive in there, you can probably be a little bit more relaxed. Um, yes, need to be mindful as we're working from home. Um, have to acknowledge we're not always able to cleanse data regularly if we can't get to offices. Uh, if anybody wants to know, I have actually found um, a company that do, they will post out confidential waste sacks and then arrange to collect them from you. Um, and it's, I think it's £95 for 10 sacks to be delivered and taken away. So it, from one address. So it could be that if people are building up paper waste that they need to dispose of, you can have a chat to your employer, organisation you're involved with, um, and arrange for that to be done. Um, certainly, I, I've got some here at the moment because I've recently moved house and brought a whole load of old paperwork with me that I no longer need. Um, so yeah, data processing isn't just um, getting the data in, it's the whole stuff, um, or giving the data to somebody else, it's the whole stuff. Um, just going back to the notebook question as well, if you have information in a notebook or on paper that you intend to type up onto a computerised system, those paper records are definitely um, treated as data in terms of the legislation. So if you take notes in a meeting and then you type the meeting up, those paper notes are deemed to be covered by the legislation. Um, final definitions, you'll be pleased to hear. We, we're nearly at the end of this um, and it gets a little bit complicated here. So we're not going to go into a great deal of detail. A data controller, uh, is who decides the purpose and means of processing. And there is this really weird phrase that happens, a natural or legal person. Does anybody know the difference? And I would like to think all my development colleagues um, in Action Together know the difference. Uh, a natural person is a real person. A legal person is a corporate body. So a limited company, a charitable incorporated organisation, etc., is a legal person. An unincorporated association, so a peer support group, something like that, quite often will not be a legal person. The difference is a natural or legal person can be taken to court. An unincorporated organisation cannot, although it's management group, trustees, committee, whatever it calls itself, those people can be taken to court as individuals. So if you are, if you work for, or you're volunteering for a corporate body, limited company, charitable or incorporated organization, your data controller will probably be the organization itself because the organization can be held legally accountable. If you work for an organisation like that and your data controller is a named individual, it might be worth saying you do realise the organisation can register as the data controller and then you will reduce your personal risk because it's the organisation then that is accountable, not you personally. Um, and a data controller, as I say, decides the purpose and means of processing data. So generally speaking, your employer says, we're going to do X for Y reason, and this is the data we will need to process in order to do it. And this is the equipment and the resources we've got to do it with. That's purpose and means. A data processor is somebody who processes on behalf of the controller. So Zoom is a data processor for this call. Action Together has determined the purpose and means of this Zoom session. 
Zoom has is, is the data processor because it's providing the platform that we're using to enable it to happen. But we have an agreement, terms and conditions with Zoom, same with Dropbox, OneDrive, Office 365, every bit of software you've got technically is a data processor enabling thing. Um, and all the legislation says is you must have agreements in place that determine how the people who manage those services um, are able to do stuff. But this is where it gets a little bit complicated. If you work for a data controller and you're processing data on their behalf, you are not a processor, you are part of the controller. <laughs> so, you know, employees of Action Together are not Action Together data processors because we're employers, employees of Action Together as the controller. So it tends to be the processor is another organization. It's somebody outside your organization who is processing on your behalf. Recipients and third party get really confusing, but they're basically two different classes of people that you might share data with. So you may come across them in documents about data sharing. Um, a data protection officer, I don't have, I am the data protection officer for Action Together. I don't have the luxury of being a legal person. I can only be a natural person. That is the difference. A controller can be a legal person or a natural person. Data protection officer must be a natural person. Some organizations are legally required to have one. It's down to whether you are defined as a public body in terms of the Freedom of Information Act, which Health Watch is, so we are, and also the size of your organization and the scale and type of data processing you do. The vast majority of small charitable organizations will not need a data protection officer but you can choose to have one voluntarily if it's useful. Um, but if you have one, even if it's voluntarily, there are things that that data protection officer must do, like training, like advise the organization, must have independent access to the board. So if they think that, for example, the chief executive or the senior leadership team are acting inappropriately in terms of data protection they can go direct to the board rather than having to be traveling through a chief executive i've i can't imagine that's likely to happen in many organizations of our type because the values we have in the um, voluntary community sector are less likely to lead to that sort of thing than they are in some other types of business but it is there in law so that is the end of definitions and the legal framework. I hope that's been useful in giving some context, helping you to think about you know, what is personal data? Why do we have data protection? What special category data? Help you think about how you spot some of those things. Does anybody have any questions? Um, got a question again. Um, specific questions, are there any specific issues which may be more frequent due to the way we're working now? I think yes. I think these are largely around data security side of data protection. Things like um, who else might have access to devices that you're using for work. Things like um, is your home Wi-Fi that you're connecting through password protected? Those sorts of things. And I would say, and it's not actually in this training, but I'm happy to talk about it. Always passwords, always passwords that are difficult to guess. Passwords that are eight characters and have a mixture of uppercase, lowercase and uh, numbers. Uh, special characters are helpful in there, but not vital. Um, try not to use the same password for everything. If you're using a mobile device that lets you just draw a pattern on the screen, replace that with 
a passcode of some sort rather than just a pattern because they're much more secure. Photo recognition or my old work iPhone's still got the old touch button so I can unlock it with my thumb. They're fine. They're still secure. Um, make sure if you're using your own or any mobile device that you do update your apps on it. You do update the operating system on it when you're prompted to. Same applies for computers that you're using should always have the operating system, have the security patches, the essential um, or critical updates installed. You don't need to worry so much about the um, advisory ones, but anything that's um, a critical or essential update you should do because quite often they update known security loopholes. Um, an out of date operating system is more vulnerable um, because it means somebody's broken into it. People know how you can break into it and you've not plugged the gap, even though you've been given a plug for the gap. Still, the chances of something happening are very low, but it's all these things just about every little bit helps. Um, if you've got questions about um, data security, the National Cyber Security Centre has some really good training resources online that you can do for free. Um, so I would recommend um, if you've not done once a year, just having a quick look, seeing um, I know we've got a couple of Action Together staff on the session here who will probably have done the one that we sent the link round for in the summer. Um, just help you to think about some of these things. Um, other things, again, cafes are closed at the moment, but if you're working in a coffee shop or a cafe, for example, on a laptop or a phone or anything, sit with your back to the wall, not to the open space or not to a window. You know, think about can somebody see over my shoulder and see what I'm doing. Just little basic things like that can can make a big difference, particularly if you're challenged. Um, so, yes, absolutely useful things to be talking about, thinking about. And again, um, if anybody has any specific questions, I'm sure we can help to find an answer in action together. I had at this point thinking it'll be about 45 minutes in, scheduled to have a bit of a break. Do people want to have a couple of minutes to get a fresh brew, go to the loo, or are you happy for us just to carry straight through? That's one person saying carry through. I'm not seeing any comments saying I want to stop. Um, so I'm gonna carry through. Um, so this is a, another new bit in the legislation and your organisation should make decisions about this. There is a thing called the lawful basis for processing. And if you are, as a couple more have said, happy to carry on. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you're reported to the information commissioner and they want to investigate, the first question they will ask is, what is your lawful basis for data processing? It's no longer acceptable just to say, well, it was useful for what we were trying to do. You have to be able to identify or your organization has to be able to identify what the lawful basis is. And on the next slide, you'll see them or on the slide coming up and you'll think, yeah, a lot of those, it's really easy to say, well, I don't even need to see a, a written rationale for why it's that. Um, but it's useful to just have those in the back of your mind. Um, and also, we talked earlier about special category data and criminal records data. Um, I'm going to tell you what the conditions are for processing those data. Uh, so lawful basis. If you remember going back to the human rights stuff, talked about consent or any other lawful basis. First on the list is consent. And I'm very controversially or potentially controversially going to say consent is a pain in the backside and is probably the least useful lawful basis for processing data. So if you're doing something that fits into one of the others, it is often more useful for you as an organization to describe it in terms of that. And I do talk about the difference between 
consent for data processing and getting permission from somebody to do something. Which is sometimes referred to as consent. So when I use the word consent, it's meant in the legal definition in terms of data protection. So you might say, you know, what we would certainly say as Health Watch is we have an information signposting service that is actually a public task, public function. So it's necessary for a public function to provide that. We could, if we're referring somebody onto another service, say our data sharing is public function. However, we will ask the person for permission before we pass it over, before we make the referral. So it's worth thinking about where is this absolutely consent is the right thing to get and where is this, it feels like consent's the easiest thing to do, but actually when we come to data subject rights and people withdrawing consent, it then becomes really challenging. So we'll come back to consent in a minute. Necessary for contractual obligation or for entering into a contract. So that quite often will relate to things like employment. You don't need to give consent for your employer to maintain your employment records or to process the data you submit as part of a job application. It is necessary for a contractual obligation or for entering into a contract. Or if you're putting a grant application in and there are individual people's names involved around the processing of that, you're sending stuff to people, you're putting names in for contacts and things like that, necessary for entering into a contract. Necessary for legal obligations other than contract. Your employer, any employer has a legal obligation to pay tax and national insurance relating to their staff. It's not necessary for the contract. The contract is between the staff member and the organisation. The payment of the tax and national insurance is a legal obligation. Because that is not a contract. It's a legal obligation. Next one is really useful if you run events, if you meet people, anything like that necessary in the vital interests of the data subject or another individual. If you know somebody, they're taken ill in your presence, you need to dial 999 for an ambulance, you know their name, you've got some next of kin contacts. It is necessary to share that data in the vital interests of that person. No need for consent, no question. It's in the vital interests that somebody who can care for that person is notified and that when the person, if they end, end up being taken into hospital, you know, they've got as much information as they can so they know who the person is. No question there. Necessary for the functions of a public body or a public task, and this is an interesting one. It's what means the NHS can process data, it's what means the council can process data, but actually, if you are providing a service on behalf of the council or an NHS body and they have a public duty to do that, you may find that your data processing is necessary for their fun public functions. So, for example, stuff around um, supporting people who are shielding through COVID. If, as a voluntary organisation, you are helping a statutory body to meet its public function in terms of that support, your data processing relating to that probably isn't consent, probably isn't a legal obligation, probably isn't contractual, arguably not in the vital interests because the vital interests are in the here and now. A safeguarding concern you might raise as a vital interest, for example, but if you're just assisting in humanitarian relief that the local authority has a statutory duty to do, you may find that your data processing could be described as necessary for the functions of a public body or necessary for a public task. And the final one is almost as challenging or maybe more challenging consent, but it's what a lot of data processing is done. In the legitimate interests of the data controller or a third party, 
balanced with any overriding legitimate interests of the data subjects. So you can say, well, actually, we provide this service and in order to provide this service, we've got to process this data. It's in our legitimate interests. That's fine. But you have to do a balancing test that says, but what is the risk to the individual data subjects of us doing that? And does what we do bring more benefit than the risk? The only place that I know of that legitimate interest does not apply is marketing. So newsletters, stuff like that, I would not be wanting to do on the basis of legitimate interests. I'd be doing those on the basis of consent because that's where consent is most useful. So those, if you can't describe what you're doing with data in terms of one of those, you shouldn't be doing it, is the bottom line. Or if your organization can't describe and can't tell you. But I think, I hope you agree, they're quite broad. There's quite a lot of scope for an awful lot of stuff in there. Um, but if challenged, your organization needs to know the lawful basis for its processing. Consent. This is a legal requirement. The Information Commissioner very clearly says consent must be freely given and specific and informed and unambiguous. Those are four tests, freely given, specific, informed, and an unambiguous indication. Um, and actually doing different things might need different consent. Um, so by a clear statement or clear affirmative action. Um, so you will have noticed where you're giving consent online, no longer are the checkboxes pre-ticked because just clicking OK at the end of a pre-ticked list isn't an affirmative action or might not be an affirmative action. So generally consent boxes should be unticked and the person has to tick them to give consent. Then it's an unambiguous indication. But actually it doesn't need to be signed. So if you're doing particularly, you, you would have met people face to face, but you're now doing work over the phone with them. Um, it is perfectly acceptable to have your consent statement as a paragraph you read and you ask them if they agree to it. And you make a note of the date and the time that you read them the paragraph and what their response was. You have to have a clear statement, which is the paragraph you've read them, and you need to have some demonstration that they consented, but the demonstration could just be a password protected spreadsheet that your organization keeps that has within each team who got consent on what dates from each client, something like that. So you, it's perfectly acceptable to do it over the phone, but you must have a record of when it was done and what was asked. So if anybody says, oh, I must have written consent, that might be a local policy in their organization, but it is not a legal requirement. The legal requirement is simply that you can demonstrate that consent was given. And um, if the information commissioner comes in because they've had a complaint about you, um, and you can show them a spreadsheet with 40 names on it with different dates and times for when they've given consent. They're likely to say, yes, we believe that you're keeping good records. If you've got a spreadsheet with three names on it or even just the one name or you can't find something, you're more likely to be in hot water. You know, it's about just demonstrating you've got a system and a process. Um, so Rachel, I believe, has had to escape or is going soon. Uh, sorry if it's a bit overwhelming. Sorry to anybody else if it's a bit overwhelming. You will get the slides and the slides do have um, some contact details on. So if you have any questions afterwards, by all means, get back. Um, gritted teeth consent is not consent. 
there must be effective choice which is why I argue that if you're using, if we go back up to lawful basis, if you're using public task as your lawful basis, you can't get consent. If you have a public duty to do something, there is no choice. It has to be done. Therefore, people can't give consent because the only consent they can give is gritted teeth. So you really do have to think, if I'm going down the consent route, what is the alternative if somebody does not give consent? And if there is not a reasonable alternative, I would argue that it's difficult to say that you're offering effective choice. So it will depend on what service you're offering, how appropriate that is. Consent, people have the right to withdraw consent at any time. But withdrawal does not have to be retro or is not retrospective. So an easy example for that is, I would say if you put somebody on a mailing list, you should get consent. If they withdraw consent, you must stop them receiving future mailings, but you do not have to delete records of mailings you've already sent them. because the consent is about the data processing of receiving the mailing. And I would say it is in your legitimate interest, a really good legitimate interest defense or definite uh, description I would use is statute of limitations says that if you have provided a service to somebody, they have it's either six or seven years in which they can take you to court if they think you've delivered a substandard service. It is in your legitimate interests to keep records of that service for that period of time so that you have data with which to defend yourself if you are taken to court. So that's where legitimate interests can be useful is saying actually it's legitimate for us as an organisation to protect ourselves. That's why a lot of organisations retention policies will say seven years. Because once the seven years is up, it's a different situation. Um, going back to consent has to be as easy to withdraw as it is to give, which is why certainly all our email newsletters and things like that have an unsubscribe button on them. Really easy way for people to withdraw consent. Pre-ticked boxes do not constitute consent. It's not an affirmative action. Um, Information Commissioner says we should be moving towards opt-in as the default. And if you want to talk about consent and children, we could take up two hours on that and still not get to the bottom of things because it's complicated. There is an age for information society services and there is a capacity test for all others. So if we want to have a conversation about that, I would suggest we do it outside of this training because we'll be here even longer than we're going to be. So anybody got any questions about lawful bases and consent before we move on? Um, just waiting for a question to formulate. I've had a wave from somebody saying they've got one. Yeah, it, it's me, uh, Peter. It's just it's just a, an illustration, a, a real life illustration of how important it is to get consent. So I worked on a project called Ambition for Aging and I was taking I was doing some filming of a group and taking some photographs and I got uh, written signed consent from each member of the group. And I explained where that where the content of that uh, of their images and the their remarks would be shared and I thought that was absolutely fine and I got all that anyway what happened was about a week later the actual chair of the group who wasn't in the original group uh, contacted me and said they wanted to they'd seen the article in a newsletter and they wanted it removing because she hadn't given consent as the chair of the group so luckily I had all the documentation with everybody's signature on of the people who were actually attending so Whilst it was okay, I thought, you know, it, it did raise the issue, whereas if somebody's the chair of a group or the organiser of a group and they don't give consent or they're not able to give consent when, say, something's done, a film or a, a, a photograph, um, how, 
you know, it's a bit tricky that one, isn't it? But whereas the people around in the room who were part of the group, the participants of the group all gave uh, consent, written consent. So I just thought it can be a bit, what, do, what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, I think it's very simple. It goes back to the very early definition. Personal data is data which relates to an identifiable living individual. If that chair is not an identifiable living individual in terms of that data, they have no control. It might be good practice to ask the chair or at least to inform the chair, but from a data protection perspective, if the image and the article do not relate to that person as an identifiable living individual, then they have no data protection rights in terms of that. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the conversation, but it does mean technically they probably couldn't insist that it was removed. Um, but yeah, a real good example. And that's why um, I think it's quite often to talk useful to talk about the difference between confidential and anonymous. Uh, and I prefer to work confidentially than anonymously because it does mean that you can, as the person doing a piece of work, refer back to the people involved if necessary. So you can say, you know, we will collect and process this information confidentially and our reports will be anonymized rather than saying we will collect this information anonymously. So it's worth just having that distinction so you can do that. Um, so conditions, if you remember, we talked about special category data um, and criminal records data. I don't think I've, have I got criminal records? No, I haven't got criminal records uh, conditions down here. I can look them up if anybody needs them. Um, you can only process special category data if explicit consent is given for the specific processing. Not blanket consent. Consent, if you look at the difference, for lawful basis, it just says consent. The condition for special category is explicit consent. So it needs to be much more detailed. It needs to say, this is exactly what we want to do with this data. Not, can we do something with this data, but this is what we propose to do in some detail. So it might be, and we would like to share it with the following organisations so that they can provide you with a service. Second condition is that it's necessary for social security or employment law. So occupational health records are necessary for employment law your employer has to be able to claim statutory sick pay, for example. Um, it's in the vital interest of the data subject, exactly the same as personal data. So if you're running an event and you know somebody has got a particular medical condition and they're taken seriously ill, again, you can share that data with the paramedics, the ambulance, with 999 or whatever, if you know it, because it's in the vital interests. Mm. Next one is particularly interesting, useful, applicable if you've got a big social media presence. If it has been manifestly made public by the data subjects actions. So if somebody posts on Facebook that they've just been diagnosed with cancer, you are permitted to process data about that because they have manifestly made it public. Necessary for legal proceedings, legal advice, legal rights. Necessary for occupational health. Necessary for public health in the public interest. And that last one is the way that NHS organisations, for example, are able to process special category health data without consent for every processing operation. But with each of these conditions, 
there are checks and balances that you must put in place. Um, so if you need to um, need some more detail on those, I'm quite happy to point people in the right direction. Your organisation should have policies that relate to those conditions and people who are doing that processing should know what those policies are. Um, so for example, Health Watch, because we deliver a public function um, around health and care, um, we have a policy around processing health and care data that meets the conditions required for that. So the last bit is sort of pulling together a whole load of that and saying, well, what are the principles? And this is the stuff that you'll probably be most familiar with um, from the past. Um, and there are several pages of principles. I've tried to do them in large print. Um, and it's the big bullets that are the principle. The smaller bullets are just my prompts to help you to understand and think about it. So first principle is any data processing must be fair, lawful and transparent. So the first question I would always ask if I'm doing something is, is that reasonable? Do I think that's a reasonable thing? First test of fairness. We've talked also about stop half a dozen people in the street and see what they think as that test of reasonably necessary. So the same sort of principle of if I asked half a dozen people would they all think this was reasonable? Has your organisation thought about what the lawful basis for processing this is? And actually have we got privacy and transparency notices and do we routinely signpost people to where they are on our website for example? Do we offer to post out paper copies if we get a new client? Those are all things you can do around fair, lawful and transparent. Purpose limitation. Don't do stuff you haven't said you're going to do. If you collect data for one reason, you know, maybe you have a set of clients, you collect their contact details as clients, you can't automatically just put them on a mailing list. That is a second purpose. That is not the purpose that you have collected their data. You can ask them if they want to go on a mailing list, and that's fine if they give consent. But you must only use data for the reason it's given. So in a larger organisation with lots of teams doing different things, we particularly think you know, places like Action Together, we have to be really careful about how some of our data is sandboxed so that one team can't see personal data relating to another team's activities because it would be very easy for that to fall outside the purpose limitation. So for example, nobody outside of the HealthWatch team in HealthWatch Tameside, nobody else in action together can see who our information signposting clients are and start offering them services because that is not the purpose that we hold the data. So there are some things you can do inside your organization about understanding what data you want to keep restricted access to maintain purpose limitation. And equally, if you're sharing data, if you're making a referral, be clear about what the purpose of that sharing is. So the person who gets the data doesn't think they can go off and do something else. Say, so, you know, I'm making this referral so X person can access Y service that you provide. You'll be clear about what you're expecting. And data minimization. Only process what is reasonable, ne reasonably necessary. You see why I keep talking about reasonable and I started at the beginning saying, well, what's reasonable um, and what's necessary? It's because it comes up a lot in these principles. Uh, what is reasonably necessary? Don't collect data for the sake of collecting data collect data because you've got a use for it and that use is legitimate and equally if you're sharing don't share more than you need to so if you're referring somebody into a service don't share the whole client file 
just share what you need to share for the person to get the service they need. As principal that you must keep information accurate and up to date, but actually you only need to check accuracy while you're actively processing. So if you've got a client who's accessed a service three years ago and you've not heard from them since, you don't need to keep going back to them to say, are your contact details still up to date? You're not processing their data, it's just in storage. But if they come back to you, come back into your service, the first thing you should do, or something you should do in your first interaction with them is say, and can I just check the details we've got for you are still accurate and up to date. So we need to check that when we're actively processing people, we keep the information up to date. If it's an ongoing client, they will usually tell us. It's usually things like moving house. Not necessarily, though, um, could be that somebody's died and we've not been notified. So it's just thinking about, you know, what we need to check accuracy why somebody could have gone into a care home. Anything can happen. So there is a duty to check periodically that things are accurate and up to date. If you've got a mailing list, distribution list for a newsletter, it's probably worth contacting people every couple of years to confirm that you've still got the correct details for them and that they still want to receive it. You know, if somebody's been on a mailing list for 10 years and never been checked, that tends to ring alarm bells. And if you're making a referral or compiling a report, again, you need to just make sure that you're accurate in that. Um, and one of the things I particularly see in some of the work that some people do through surveys and things like that is they don't ask people when something happened. And, you know, you're running a focus group and somebody says, oh, this really horrible thing happened with my doctor. And you don't ask, well, what month and what year? You, you would assume it's recent. You ask what month and what year and quite often it's two, three, four years ago. And is that still accurate and up to date? Is my question. So there is something about just thinking, how clear can I be in terms of accuracy and timeliness? Storage minimization, you should not be keeping personal data longer than is necessary. Excuse me. Um, your organization should have data retention policies that say, this is how long we keep stuff. Your organization should have a process in place that says on an, an annual basis or a quarterly basis, depending on what things are, individual teams are responsible for checking the data that they are managing and disposing of stuff that is outside our data retention policy. Um, so, that kind of speaks for itself. If you've got lots of confidential data that like, dates back a long time, you should be asking yourself, do I need to keep this? Um, slightly more complicated if it's health related data, because there is the question of, is it on somebody's medical record? Should it be on somebody's medical record? Because medical records must be kept for the lifetime of the person and a period of time afterwards. Security, integrity, confidentiality. We've talked about passwords, we've talked about accounts. You should never give somebody else your login credentials for any device. You should never log in on somebody else's account. Because if there's a data breach, you need an audit trail. If somebody needs to access your account, there should be a process that they go through with your um, IT provider or with somebody in a management role that authorizes that access, records when authorization was given and, authorize, and records when the person actually accessed and when the access stopped. 
should be done at management level and records kept because there is data implications. So if you've got volunteers working on a database, each volunteer theoretically should have their own login details. When somebody leaves an organisation, their account should be deactivated straight away, not deleted, but deactivated. Keep the account so you can see what they've done, but deactivate it. And your organisation should have systems in place for that to happen. Talked about iPads, laptops, smartphones. Um, just think about what would happen if it got lost. So it's always good if you're, you've got a laptop or an iPad or something like that and you are moving from one place to another in the public domain to shut it down. Don't just put it to sleep because you know, certainly all our laptops have got a encryption on the hard drives. That encryption doesn't always kick in when you snooze something, but it does when you shut it down. If you know, anybody who works for Action Together will know that that blue screen that asks for their BitLocker password only comes up when you start. It doesn't come up when you reboot from snooze. So that's why I say you should always shut down if you're moving from one place to another. Same with an iPad, um, the security on boots through an iPad or any other tablet has more layers to it than just pressing the unlock button. So shut down where possible if you're moving around, particularly these days where modern laptops boot up so quickly because of the solid state drives. Um, data sharing agreements, um, these take all sorts of forms, but we should have them. If we're giving um, if we're being asked to send data to another organisation, there should be some form of data sharing agreement in place, unless it's being done purely on, as a one off on the basis of consent. Your manager should know where those are, your organisation should know. Backups, we've talked about, should be done at an organisational level. Um, important one for that is if you're particularly if you're working from home, you should be saving your work not onto your laptop, but onto your server, because your server is backed up, your laptop might not be. And one that's important, but particularly when you're in the same physical space of people is just don't talk about stuff that you don't need to. I've gone the wrong way there. Um, so we've I've answered this question a bit, but if anybody's got any things they want to ask or suggest about making sure that data processing you do in your role follows those principles, screen. I have the sound of silence. Um, so I think we've talked about a lot of the practical things as we've gone through that list. There is another principle of accountability, and this is at an organisational level rather than an individual level, but it's worth you just knowing. The controller is responsible for and has to be able to demonstrate compliance with the principles and the legislation. Your managers are accountable for organising how that happens. So you need to keep records of what you do if you're making a decision about data processing so you can, your manager can then know what decisions you've made and why, and they can be held to account if necessary. And if you do something new, you may have to complete a data protection impact assessment. Um, certainly, I know we've got quite a few Action Together people on the call. If you're doing it in Action Together, just drop me an email. If you're outside our organisation and you want a hand with it, I can certainly point you in the direction of some templates and things like that that should help with it. And we're on the final section, you will be pleased to hear. And it's 
no news to you, I suspect, because they relate very, very closely with the principles. And this is data subjects rights. And actually, you need to know how to respond because quite often people have a right to request something that does not automatically mean you have to do what they ask for. Examples of that as we go, and I might ask you for some examples. Um, so if you follow data protection principles, the rights will follow without too much hard work. You have to respond, but your initial response can be just an acknowledgement and a commitment to say, we will get back to you on this. Just want to assure you we've received it, we're taking it seriously, we're going to look into things, we'll get back to you. Normally, you have a month in which to respond, but it sometimes can be extended if there are good reasons. As I've said, you don't always have to do what they ask. And you should not respond on your own. You should always ask within your organisation. Ask a colleague, see what they think. Ask a manager. If you've got a data protection officer, ask a data protection officer. If you're really not sure, ask action together. The first right, you should never been asked. The right to be informed. This relates to fair processing. If you've got the right policies in place, you've put your um, privacy notices um, in place and you're following your policies and your processes, this just happens automatically. People know what processing you're doing because it's built into the processing that you're doing to make sure that it's there in the public domain. So I'm pretty sure if you go on Action Together's website, you will see some policies relating to data protection and some privacy notices. Um, I tend to call them, I prefer calling them transparency notices because they're anti-privacy notices. They don't tell you where you're keeping the data private. They tell people where you're going to disclose the data. Um, so it's more about being transparent than it is about being private. Um, but we can't change the way the laws worded. Um, so the right to be informed should just happen by dint of your organisation doing stuff and being GDPR compliant. Subject access. This is one of the most common subject rights. This is about a data subject being able to see what data you hold about them. Interesting question here. When do you think you shouldn't let them have access to or potentially even know about data you hold. Anybody, any thoughts? Hello, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you, Jane. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing when you put somebody in danger, is a child protection issue, something like that? Absolutely, risk is an issue. Um, maybe something around a If you believe that or you have data that says somebody is at risk of suicide and you've got some data that you think might um, cause them increased trauma, I would certainly be looking at getting advice around that before disclosing it. Um, one that you don't often think about but is actually in the legislation is if, for example, the benefits agency contact you because they're investigating somebody for benefits fraud, you would not disclose that they have contacted you. You would not tell that person that they are being investigated. So just because somebody asks for data doesn't mean necessarily you give them all the data. But if you're not sharing data, you've got to have a blinking good reason for not doing it so that if they report you to the information commissioner you can say well actually this is the process we went through to determine that we shouldn't share this particular data with them rectification this usually follows subject access 
if you give somebody access to their data and they think, oh, another one actually, going back to subject access, what if there's a second data subject in the data? That's when redaction comes in and you might get some stuff blanked out because you don't, there are other people in the data who you don't want to disclose or you can't get consent for disclosure. If there are other people in the data and you're comfortable disclosing it, you would probably want to go out to consent. Um, rectification, if somebody's seen data and they think there's an error, they have the right to request rectification. But what circumstances might you not rectify it? Simple one is if you don't think it's wrong. If your recollection of a situation and theirs are different, what I would recommend is not that you change it to something that you then know to be wrong or believe to be wrong, but to say to the person, we have a different recollection of that situation. Can we agree a statement that is added to the record to reflect your, your view of things as well as ours? So it's not rectified, but it is, amend it is added to, so it gives a more balanced picture of the two different opinions. Erasure, this is my, I think probably the worst publicized right that came in with GDPR. Um, it was often referred to as the right to be forgotten. Um, so, um, so when do you think it'd be okay not to erase the data? I'm guessing the comment is if they're subject to police investigations, absolutely. Um, another one would be actually you've got another lawful basis or you have a lawful basis for retaining it. Um, you know, let's say somebody's got a credit card bill for £7,000. They have the right to ask their credit card provider to erase all data about them. That credit card provider is not going to erase a £7,000 debt because of GDPR. So, you know, there is the right to request, but in reality, it only applies if you have not followed, if we go back to the principles, the data minimization, purpose limitation, storage minimization principles. If you've still got data that you shouldn't have, that is when the right for erasure comes in. Not just, I don't want you to have any information about me anymore. If you've got a lawful basis for processing it, the right for erasure generally will not apply. You might choose to erase it, you might agree to erase it, but it is probably not an absolute right because you will have a lawful basis for retaining that data, potentially. Right for restriction is generally around withdrawal of consent or somebody says, I don't want you to do that. If you're processing on another basis and they don't want you to do something and it's not reasonably necessary. Um, but again, you've got that issue around consent and um, real choice, genuine choice. If restricting processing means you restrict the service, you would want to have that conversation with the person saying, yeah, we can do this, but this is the implication for you in terms of accessing our services if we do do that. Objection links with erasure and restriction. And this is about if they object to processing because they think it's unfair or unlawful. They're very closely linked, a lot of these rights. 
um, which is why I would say if you get somebody requesting that they access their rights, talk to somebody. I don't always get all the information right off the top of my head. Um, you probably can't see behind me on the shelf, but that's my heap of data protection resources that if somebody asks me a question, I go and look things up in, as well as going on the Information Commissioner's website and various other places. Um, so they do need a bit of thinking about, this is just general guidance. Portability is unlikely to apply to the voluntary community sector. Uh, generally, it's things like, um, if you're moving from one insurance company to another, it's the right for your information to be passed between them without you having to answer 50 million questions every blink in time it happens. Profiling and automated decision making again is unlikely to apply to us. Most common automated decision making is things like credit applications where it just goes through a computer. And the right is basically that if somebody doesn't like the response from an automated decision making process, they have the right for a human being to review the process. And that human being can then change the decision if they feel that the automated decision is incorrect. Um, so just a reminder, rights are complex. You don't necessarily have to do what's requested and you should always have advice. And I will always look things up if I'm asked um, rather than just go off the top of my head because they do overlap a little bit and sometimes you can get confused. So acknowledge, say, we're taking this seriously. We're looking into it. We will get back to you. Maybe give a time frame for when you'll get back to them. Um, so yeah, we're going to be finished fairly soon. There's about three slides left, I think. Um, so just acknowledge, uh, make sure you get advice. So when things go wrong, and unexpected things will happen. Um, we've had four data breaches at Action Together that have involved our data this financial year. They just happen. They have all been very minor breaches. We've not actually hit the threshold on any of them that has required notifying the um, Information Commissioner's Office, but we have had to investigate every one. We have had to document it. We have, have had to think about learning from it. So if something happens, don't panic. They are going to happen from time to time. The bigger the organisation, the more frequently they will happen. Um, first thing is tell somebody as soon as you can. If you've got a data protection officer, tell them. Tell your manager. As I say, if there is a data breach and it, is re it hits the threshold for reporting to the data protection officer, that, uh, to the information commission officer, that must be done within 72 hours unless there are real exceptional circumstances. And I reckon it takes a day to go through that risk assessment process to decide whether it needs reporting or not. Might only take half an hour to do the risk assessment, but then there's work associated with just looking things up, checking things out, wanting a bit more information. Ask for advice if something goes wrong. I'm always available for a brief chat, whether or not you work for Action Together. Um, you have 10 minutes of my time, if it makes life easier for somebody else, is 10 minutes I'm always happy to give. Information Commissioner's Office website has really good resources on it. Check there, see what things are. Don't panic, most things can be resolved. And generally, even if something gets as far as the Information Commissioner's Office, if you can demonstrate you've genuinely done your best, your organisation has a culture of learning and you say, we'd love your help to make sure this doesn't happen again, you might get a mild telling off, but you're unlikely to get a big fine. You're unlikely to be listed as an organisation that's had a, a finding against it by the Information Commissioner because you can demonstrate goes back to that bit I said about make sure you've got records about the decisions you make about data. 
if you can demonstrate that you've done your best, you're likely to come out of any difficult situation more positively and learn from it. You know, every, every incident that I become aware of, I sit down and say, what can we do? How can we reduce the risk of this happening again? And it could be something as simple as copying and pasting two names into the wrong column. You know, that's one of our data breaches. Two names were copied and pasted into the wrong column in a document. No sensitive information, very little. In fact, the only personal information was those two people's names. Um, but we can learn from it by saying, well, how can we make sure that somebody double checks before it gets sent out? You know, just little things like that that reduce the risk. Um, so don't panic. Make sure somebody else knows you will never be on your own in the corner if something's gone wrong with data protection, if you're upfront and honest about it at the beginning and say, I just want some advice, I could do with some help. Any questions? So I have a question for you. I think, did we do it? I hope we've helped you to spot personal data and think about how you process it appropriately and to understand what personal data is and what special category data is. I hope we've helped you to think about what data processing you do in your role. I hope we've helped you to think about who's accountable in your organization. When you get the slides, you will have a reminder of what the lawful basis for data processing and the conditions for special category processing are. You'll know what the data protection principles are and what data subjects rights are and what to do if something goes wrong. So that was less than two hours. All I will say is thank you. Um, if you've got any questions, any support needs, action together, our main info at mailbox and our main switchboard are the first place to direct anything um, and then can potentially go to either a member of the development team or to me as data protection officer depending on what's needed. Um, hopefully that's not been too dull and boring. I know data protection is not the most dynamic of subjects and Zoom is not the most dynamic of delivery media. So from my perspective, I'm going to say thank you very much and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks for that, Peter. I'm going to stop recording now.